Hi, Cottondale family. Welcome to another prayer meeting with uh, Cottondale, and it's a privilege to be with you tonight. We're going to continue walking through the book of uh, Daniel this evening. Um, we're getting in towards the latter part of the book of Daniel, where um, it we start delving into some of the apocalyptic portions of the book of Daniel, which if you recall, uh, apocalyptic literature is like uh, the end of the book of Daniel and the book of Revelation, where there's, you know, beasts coming out of the sea and all kinds of stuff like that. It's very symbolic language um, that um, tells us about the future, but oftentimes in a veiled or mysterious kind of way. And because of that, uh, apocalyptic literature, like what we're going to be talking about, is very difficult to interpret. And so um, it may frustrate you a little bit that I'm not going to go over every detail and I'm not going to land uh, hard on any type of interpret, uh, particular uh, interpretation. Um, you know, it would require a, a lot of study to... Uh, to try to piece all that together, and um, but, uh, and I don't know if I'm ready for that yet. But um, the main thrust of it, and I think what the main thing that that God wants us to get out of the Book of Daniel is clear enough, and and that's what we're going to talk about tonight. And so before we begin, um, what you'll definitely want to do is read the Book of Daniel chapter seven. Uh, I mean, uh, read the chapter of uh, Daniel chapter 7. Um, and if you're with someone, you know, it'd be a good idea to read it together. That way it's fresh on your mind as we walk through it because uh, a lot kind of happens. And so go ahead and hit the pause button, read through Daniel chapter 7, and join back with me when you're done. Okay. So let me jump back to the beginning here. All right. So we're just going to um, read the first uh, several verses here of chapter 7 and kind of just talk about it a little bit, okay? So it says, In the first year of, year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel saw a dream and visions of his head as he lay in his bed. And then he wrote down the dream and told the sum of the matter. Daniel declared, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of heaven were stirring up the great sea, and four great beasts came up out of the sea, different from one another. The first was like a lion and had eagle's wings. Then, as I looked, its wings were plucked off, and it was lifted up from the ground and made to stand on two feet like a man, and the mind of a man was given it. And behold, another beast, the second one, like a bear. It was raised up on one side. It had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth, and it was told, Arise, devour much flesh. After this I looked, and behold, another, like a leopard, with four wings of a bird on its back, and the beast had four heads, and dominion was given to it. After this I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, terrifying and dreadful and exceedingly strong. It had great iron teeth, it devoured and broke in pieces and stamped out and stamped what was left with its feet. It was different from all the other beasts that were before, and it had ten horns. I considered the horns, and behold, there came up among them another horn, a little one, uh, before which the three of the first horns were plucked up by the roots. And behold, in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man, and a mouth speaking great things. All right, you got all that? We'll just move on. <laughs> Um, so let's just jump back here and uh, just make a few observations, okay? Uh, it says the first year, year of Belshazzar, and so, um, if you'll go back in, in the, the story of the writing on the wall, I believe that was, um, Belshazzar, and basically what we see here is that, uh, we just noticed that the book of Daniel isn't in a chronological order. Um, and so that may surprise you, but um, many in many in no, numerous cases, um, even in some of the in, in the Gospels, for example, the they're not always necessarily in 
uh, chronological order, but they're arranged and organ. The material is arranged and organized for various purposes that the author has, and so um, this actually makes sense because uh, in this section here, it is um, it is the beginning of the kind of more apocalyptic section of the book, and so it would make sense that he kind of groups whoever you know Daniel um, who wrote it or uh, is. Um, is uh, kind of grouping all those types of writings together. Okay, so he has this vision, okay, and it's apocalyptic type vision, and it says um, the four winds of heaven were stirring up the great sea. And so, um, you know, you got to be careful trying to read too much into it than you can, but, you know, I think there's some things that we can glean from this. For example, you know, four winds in the Bible or... or often refers to the earth. You know, the four winds refer, refers to the... Um, uh, in Revelation, it, it says there's four angels at the four corners of the earth holding back the four winds. And so, and so it basically means... It basically is just kind of a, a reference to, you know, the, the totality of, of, um, of earth. Okay. And so, and so we have the four winds of heaven... Uh, we're stirring up the great sea, and and in biblical language, I mean, in, even in the same in Revelation, you have these beasts coming out of the sea. Um, the the sea could be very dangerous, as we all know, and tempestuous, and a very frightening thing. And if you're out on the water and a storm comes up, uh, and you're just in a little boat, I mean, there's virtually nothing you can do, and so. Some people relate it to in the beginning um, when God created everything in Genesis chapter 1. It says um, that the earth was, uh, without, was uh, without formless and void. And it says that the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And so some take kind of the sea to represent this, this original chaos, okay, this unorganized chaos that needs to come under God's subjection and so anyways the sea often has negative in this kind of context has negative connotations okay of um of uh of uh, destruction and disorder and chaos okay and so and so what we see so far then is we have uh the four winds stirring up the great sea so basically we have chaos within the earth okay <laughs> chaos within the earth T tempestuousness within the earth that's going to bring that's going to bring up this um, these beasts, okay, and uh, and th so these beasts come out of the sea and they're different, and so we learn that it's these kingdoms, these evil, uh, these pagan evil kingdoms which are in rebellion against God that 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 come upon the earth and uh, and bring uh, disorder and sin, right? Okay, so the first was like a lion. And had eagle's wings. Okay, so again, you know, s scholars debate this. I I'm not sure, but but I think there's a good argument that can be made that um, uh, this chapter seven here correlates um, in a literary way with Daniel chapter two. Okay, and if you remember there. There was the vision of this um, of uh, this statue, right? And it had what? It had four parts, right? A head of gold, uh, silver, bronze, and then iron for the feet, right? So four parts. But what do we have in this vision here? We have four beasts, right? And and we, we and if you just read through the chapter, you know at the end of the chapter, the interpretation of this that the angel gives Daniel is uh, that there are four there are four kingdoms. Right, and that was that's the same interpretation of the of the giant statue with four parts. So I think it's probably likely that we should interpret this along the same lines as um as Daniel chapter two, and and um and if that parallel is the same, then then most likely the first beast is going to be um is going to be the kingdom of uh, Babylon. Okay, and so Babylon was mighty like a lion, and it was swift like an eagle in its conquering. Okay, and um, 
its wings were plucked off and it was lifted up from the ground. Uh, okay, and so that could just be a reference to how Babylon, as as mighty as it was, was um, lost its strength. Right, and Daniel, we see that in the book of Daniel itself. Daniel was there in um, in Babylon when it was captured. Uh, by the Medes and the Persians, okay, and so it, it was so it was plucked up and it's lo- and and it, it lost its its power, okay. So that probably probably I think refers to Babylon, and so there's another beast, okay, a second one like a bear, and it was raised up on one side, and again, it's hard to know for sure, but you know, the second kingdom is typically thought of as the Medes and the Persians. And uh, I believe it was, and, and the Persians, um, I believe, were stronger than the Medes. In that part, it was, was I believe it was the Persians. Uh, and, and so in that sense, it was raised up on one side there. And so that's just one thought that some people think, okay? Um, and three ribs in its mouth, you know, what that means, I'm not sure. Just it, But it shows the, uh, it says, arise, devour much flesh. So it shows the... Um, uh, we could call it the ferociousness, right, of the kingdom. No, notice here that all the all the all the kingdoms are described as what as beasts, right? We have a lion, we have a bear. Okay, the next one here is a leopard, and the next one is a is just an unnamed conglomeration conglomerate type beast. Okay, but they're all what they're all they're all beasts. They're all um uh ferocious beasts. Okay. And so, notice all these nations, they're not necessarily being painted in a pretty picture here. But rather, it's saying that they're, they're at enmity with God and an enmity with God's people. And, 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 um, and essentially uh, devour God's people. Okay? And so, the next one here is a leopard. So, the last one was, like I said, probably the Medes and the Persians. And this one's is a leopard. And it has four wings of a bird on its back, and the beast had four head, and dominion was given to it. And so again, if we compare it with chapter 2 there in the, the, the statue, this is probably the kingdom of, of Greece. Okay, And what's fascinating about that, if that's the case, um, is that leopard among the beasts listed so far, the leopard is going to be among the swiftest. Um, and the wings kind of indicate that as well. And the Greece was made prominent by Alexander the Great, whose kingdom spread from from Europe all the way to India. And he was 32 <laughs> when he died. And he, 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 his conquest was extremely rapid over all of these nations. And it says that the beast here had four heads. And it's pretty well known that after Alexander the Great died, uh, again in his early 30s, his kingdom was pretty well divided up among four gen- four generals who became actually prominent, okay? And those four generals kind of exerted prominence within the remainder of the Greek kingdom after Alexander died, okay? And so perhaps that is the four heads that the beast had, okay? It's the four generals that took over the Greek empire after Alexander the Great died, okay? And dominion was given to it, Okay? And then he says, finally, a fourth beast, terrifying and exceedingly strong. Again, if we that that seems to point us back to uh, the chapter the chapter two vision, okay, of the statue. Because remember, uh, the the foot of the statue was a fourth kingdom, and it was made of iron, which was characterized. And see, there's there's iron there, iron teeth, and it's characterized as. And iron, of course, is exceedingly strong. It's not it's not majestic uh, like gold is okay but it is strong okay and so that gives us some warrant to to kind of compare the two okay so this fourth beast is exceedingly strong and devoured and broke into pieces what was left um and all the beasts that were before and if we compare it with chapter two there this would be the kingdom of rome which was of course a very strong (laughs) and fierce kingdom that that uh, that exerted its great power and influence, um, uh, conquering the the Greek Empire. Okay. And then the beast had ten horns, and he considered the horns. Okay, and um, there was a little horn that came up, 
Uh, and the three of the first horns were plucked up by its roots, and a mouth was speaking great things. And so, you know, um, this one, this one's a little bit, this point is a little bit more challenging to point to. Um, the little horn later in the book of Daniel and some other visions seems to point to uh, one who's described as a little horn seems to point to, which we'll talk about later, I suppose, um, one of the Greek kings who uh, ruled over Israel uh, during the during the time uh, before um, the Roman Empire uh, gained gained prominence over there. Um, so it, you know, and and so and people debate exactly what who the little horn was or whatever but the point is is it it become this little horn becomes a picture of someone who is in great defiance against god someone who lifts up themselves and exalts themselves in a very proud proud and arrogant way which we know many kings <laughs> did that all right so as we reflect on these things, there's some things we can think about. What fears or concerns do you have about the world powers? Okay, they, you know, uh, that is in ancient times that was always on the radar because you know we might not think about it as much now, but in ancient times, if you were if you lived as part of a citizen of a certain kingdom, you actually really never knew, especially, you know, in, in America, it's weird because we're kind of isolated. We have two oceans on either side of us, right? But in the in the in in Europe and in the Middle East, um, there's no, you know, there's a, there's a land, there's a way to get by land to almost everywhere, okay? So if you were a citizen in ancient times, you really lived with the, the understanding that at any time a, a neighboring nation could grow in strength and try to conquer your your nation, um, you know, and that could be a very frightening thing, right? Well, even today, we have fears and concerns about the world powers, and maybe we don't think about it as much as we should, but we should think about the the power, the conflict in world powers and the, the outplaying of history that's taking place before our very eyes. We should think about it and pray to God for our own nation and for the world that His righteousness and justice would prevail. These nations are presented as evil beasts, and the fact of the matter is, is that um, just about every nation is going to pursue its own ends. Um, what it perceives will make it the best and the strongest, because human sinful nature is to uh, work, you know, to to gather power for yourself, <laughs> right? And so, what we should pray then is that God's righteousness and justice would prevail in the world. That that God would that God would work and in such a way that nations wouldn't just um, seek their own uh, ends for dominance, but would actually work towards human flourishing. Um, but really, that's all by the grace of God. And so we just gotta pray that God would. That God would help our land to be as righteous as possible, um, and uh, and that that He would just have that He would just have mercy on our on our world. But uh, we're, we're but we are not guaranteed uh, peace on earth. That's going to come, but uh, that's only going to come when the real the the ultimate King, the King of Kings returns then there'll be peace on earth but as long as man is in charge it's not going to happen but we just pray that god would give us as much as he would for now number two here just think about this question why is it important to remember that god controls human history if you go back and look at the passage we just read it says you know it, it was given it, it was given to the beast it was given to them it was given to that in other words god is the one who is in control of the unfolding of human history, which is why he can tell us about it, right? And so, why is it important to remember that? I'm sure it's. I'm sure you can think of you know these reasons pretty easily. Why it's important to remember that God controls human history. Well, if we remember that, you know, it should guard us uh, from fear, right? To know that these things, these big happenings that are going on, these things that 
that involve entire nations, okay, and the, and the working of the whole world, it seems like, um, and the turmoil that's happening in other parts of the world, we would just think, man, this just seems chaotic. But God's in control. And, 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 des- and from Christianity, we learn that history is going in a line, okay? It, it's converging to a point, <laughs> And we know how it ends. We might know. We might not know all the stuff that happens in the middle, but we know where it's headed, right? And so God controls the unfolding of history. So pray that God would give you a confident trust in His sovereignty, and a peace, not an anxiety, over the things which we have no control. There's no point in worrying things you can't control, especially when you know that the one who does control them is faithful and true. So. Take some time, think through these things, pray through these these things, and pick back up with me when you're done. All right, we're going to keep moving here. Uh, Next, it says, As I looked, the thrones were placed, and the Ancient of Days took his seat, and his clothing was white as snow, and the hair of his head like pure wool. His throne was fiery flames, and and its wheels were burning fire. A stream of fire issued and came out from before him. A thousand thousand served him. Ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The court sat in judgment and the books were opened. I looked then because of the sound of the great words that the horn was speaking. And I looked and as I looked the beast was killed and its body destroyed and given over to be burned with fire. As for the rest of the beasts, their dominion was taken away, but their lives were prolonged for a season and a time. I saw in the night visions, and behold, the clouds of heaven, there came like, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like a son of man. And he came to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. You see that? This is incredible here, I think. It's amazing. So Daniel sees this vision of all these beasts and these crazy, terrifying, you know, monsters, okay, that are terrorizing the earth, right? And and, I, and if you had that vision, I'm sure you'd be terrified too. But then he sees a different vision that's totally different. And after that, and it, what does it do? It puts that first vision in perspective. He looks at the other vision and he gets scared. But then he sees this one. He says, wait a second. All that may be going on, but look. God's, God's sitting down. <laughs> He's sitting down on his throne. He's not worried about it. He's the king over it. Okay? And this image is... Incredible clothing, white as snow, hair white as wool. That, that's a picture of holiness and purity and wisdom, right? And his throne was a fiery flames, and his wheels were burning with fire. This is, this is interesting because only in Ezekiel does do we have this vision of a throne with wheels, okay? And you know Daniel and Ezekiel were contemporaries, okay? They probably knew each other. And so it's interesting there that in Daniel's vision, he would have this same picture of God's throne that Ezekiel does. And that's the only two places in the Bible where it's described like that. But the, but the fiery flames of, of the throne, um, and you know, it's kind of like a, the wheels is interesting, isn't it? It's like, it's like a throne chariot, right? It's like a throne where, from which he reigns. But it's also like a, it has wheels. It's like a chariot in which God rides into battle. And that's the picture of the fire, right? Fire is a symbol of divine judgment, okay? A stream of fire issued and came out before him. That's the same thing. What is that? It's divine judgment. A thousand, thousand, certain, thousand times ten thousand. The court sat in judgment, okay? So what is this picture? It's a, it's a, it's a divine, it's a divine court session, Right? God is sitting on his throne as the ultimate judge. He has thousands upon thousands of the heavenly hosts and servants who worship him. And they're all sitting in the courtroom, if you will, where God is going to execute judgment on the earth. On what? On those, on the, the idolatrous pagan nations. Those who rebelled against him and created chaos and, and evil in the world. God is in control of all that. And there's a time appointed where he's going to sit down. And judgment's going to happen, right? Okay? 
and the, there's this the horn we saw was speaking these great words um but the beast is killed and is destroyed and given over to be burned with fire that means that i mean however you want to look you know how you want to look at it and read it and take it but but um rome kind of rep it seems to me especially when you compare it with the new testament Rome kind of takes on, in the book of Revelation especially, Rome kind of takes on this picture of the world system of evil, okay? This world system of corruption that comes to characterize the whole world, okay? So it represents Rome, but it's, it's more than just Rome. And so if we take the beast in that way as Rome in that sense, okay, what this means then is that God has appointed a day where he's going to overturn the world system <laughs> the world system of greed of evil of pride of pride of violence of sexual morality of all of, of of everything god's going to the whole world system that is built upon um, uh evil is is going to be judged it's going to be killed <laughs> okay and when he judges it and destroys it that will be the time um when another king is going to set up his kingdom. And this, this brings into our next part there. Okay. Um, and so what we see here is one, I think one of the most important Old Testament passages. And this is it, is, it is Daniel's vision of the Son of Man. I saw in the night visions, and behold, clouds with the clouds of heaven came one like a Son of Man. Now what is striking about this is that coming with the clouds of heaven is is Old Testament language of God. It is God who is said to come with the clouds of heaven in vengeance and just and judgment. But what is interesting is that in Daniel's vision, it is a son of man who is the one riding the cloud. And a son of man is a Hebrew idiom. Ben Adam is the 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 actual Hebrew. Okay? And it, it, it emphasizes humanity or humanity, okay? And, and so in this, in this vision here, Daniel is, in, is in, a, in a remarkable way linking God with a man, right? I mean, we know that in the New Testament, but in the Old Testament, right? This is just mysterious, right? He is linking the coming judgment of God with the coming of a, of a man, Okay? who comes to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. And he, this, this God-man, is given dominion and glory and a kingdom that what? That all the nations that were causing all this chaos are going to what? They're going to serve him. <laughs> the one king and his dominion, unlike the other, remember all the other kingdoms, God comes and he judges and he kills the beasts, right? But this kingdom is different. This kingdom isn't going to ever go down, all right? It's one that shall not be destroyed. Okay, so ask yourself this question. Where does God stand in relation to the nations? Right? It's a pretty obvious question there, but just reflect on it because there's some important truth there that is important to remember. Next, try to imagine yourself in the scene of Daniel 7, the Ancient of Days on his fiery throne. Just close your eyes and maybe read the passage again in your Bible and close your eyes and just try to put yourself there. That is what God is like. It's more it's un it's it's unfathomable. But it's worth trying. And if you put and if you can just try to put yourself there in your truly try to put yourself there in your mind's eye. Make it an opportunity to worship, to get a big view of God because he's bigger and greater than we could possibly imagine. Next, why is the Son of Man so significant? Try to answer that question. Go back and look at the text. What makes him such a big deal? He's a really big deal. <laughs> what makes him such a big deal? And then reflect on the eternality of Jesus' kingdom. Right? We know that, that Jesus is this Son of Man. Jesus referred to himself as the Son of Man. Right? It's his kingdom. Pray, if you're not part of the kingdom... Pray that you will be part of it because it's the only kingdom that will last. Everything else is going to be judged and destroyed. Or if you're part of the kingdom, rejoice that you belong to a kingdom that will never end. Take some time, work through these things, and pick back up with me when you're done.
All right, we're going to be real brief on this last one here. It's just a couple verses, a few verses. Daniel says, As for me, my spirit within me was anxious. The visions of my head alarmed me. I approached one of those who stood there and asked him the truth concerning all this. So he told me and made known to me the interpretation of these things. These four great beasts are four kings who shall arise out of the earth, but the saints of the Most High shall receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever and ever. And so this is a very brief interpretation from the angel of those visions. And put very simply, it's the four beasts, the four kings, four kingdoms, okay? But, and so this is, a, he doesn't go into lots of detail, okay? He just tells us, but the saints of the Most High shall receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever and ever. That's really, a lot of it is complex. A lot of it's difficult. We don't know exactly what refers to what, but guess what? This is all you need to know. There's kingdoms and kings that will come and go, but the saints of the Most High will possess the kingdom forever. These other kingdoms will come, but they're temporary kingdoms. But there is an eternal kingdom, and only the saints of the Most High get in that one, and which is the only one that will last forever. And so as we finish out this evening, that's the most important thing to take away, probably from the book of Daniel, right? God is king, Jesus is Lord, and if you're part of his kingdom, you're part of the only kingdom that lasts forever. Every other kingdom, every other nation, United States of America, a billion years from now, it won't matter, but the kingdom of heaven lasts forever. Are you a citizen of the kingdom of heaven? Will you possess it forever? So as we close, reflect on this. Christians reign with Christ. Does your faithfulness in little now qualify for you much then. As I was thinking about this passage, it made me think of the parable from Jesus. You remember that parable? Jesus, or, or the saying Jesus said, if you're, faith, if you're faithful in little, you'll be faithful with much. If you're not faithful in little, you won't be faithful with much. If you're faithful with the little, Jesus said he'll set you over much in his kingdom. If you're faithful in the little things now, who knows what you'll rule over in the age to come. Okay? So that's the question to think about. Am I faithful in little so that God can trust me with much? Because our passage said what? That we will possess, the saints will possess the kingdom. That means we'll rule in it. We'll reign. We're not just, we won't just be there. We'll actually rule with Christ. He will share his authority over the earth with us and we'll reign with him. And our reigning then will be proportional to our faithfulness now. And then finally, pray for Christ's kingdom to come. Pray for him to make everything right. The world's a mess, and everybody knows it. But at the end of the day, there's only one person who can make it right. And it's not me, and it's not you, and it's not a president or a prime minister. It's Jesus Christ. And so let's pray for Jesus to come back and to make everything right, because that's our only hope. So as we finish out, take some time and pray through these things and pick back up with me one last time when you're done. All right, I hope it has been a blessing to kind of look at this chapter uh, this evening. And as always, it's a pleasure to share in this time with you. I hope you have a great rest of the week. Please stay safe out there. You know that, um, that COVID's kind of hit a spike here in our county, so please be in prayer for those that are suffering. Uh, I hope to see you this Sunday as we worship uh, Jesus, who is the Lord of all. And if there's anything we can do for you in the meantime, please don't hesitate to ask. Again, hope you have a great week. God bless you.